Turing actions, shooting weak side, and reticles for rim fires. This week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this Monday, our first question comes from Ryan on Facebook. And Ryan says, how important is truing actions or lapping bolts when trying to reach out for long-range shooting, hunting, or competition? Uh, well, Ryan, lapping bolts is really not something that I recommend. And... When you take uh, something like, uh, for instance, let's talk about a factory Remington 700 rifle. Now, a Remington 700, the bolt head and the bolt lugs are actually part of the bolt body. They're not a separate piece like they are on some of the Savage rifles and some other rifles out there. Uh, so the bolt itself is actually part of the bolt body that you manipulate when you close the bolt. Uh, so that bolt head is rigidly fixed along the axis of the bolt body. Uh, what you very often get with a factory Remington 700 is the back of those two bolt lugs do not engage fully with the inner ring in the receiver uh, that is the opposite mating surface for those lugs. Uh, now what, what a uh, lapping is supposed to do is instead of just having a piece of one lug engaging that opposite lug in the receiver, uh, lapping is supposed to wear down those high spots so that all of the lugs actually engage. Uh, the problem with lapping is you don't really have any way to finally control uh, what gets worn down and where things are. Uh, so you're just basically rubbing metal away uh, indiscriminately and through the lapping process, the high points, the points that have the most pressure, should wear quickest, and the low points should wear a little bit more slowly, so eventually those surfaces will mate together. Uh, well, the problem that you have is what we really want, we don't just want those surfaces to mate together, we want that breech face to maintain a specific orientation to the axis of the bore. That way your cartridge stays as straight as possible uh, when it's chambered. It doesn't have a tendency to cock off to one side or the other. Uh, when that rifle fires and you have those forces pushing back, we want those lugs to push back equally uh, so that everything stays aligned. And when you actually lock the bolt up in a Remington, it's up and down. You have a lug at 12 o'clock and a lug at 6 o'clock. Uh, so we want those to maintain their orientation, and we don't want um, there to be any offset when the rifle fires. Um, so because of this, lapping is the cheap and easy way to do it. You can just go buy some valve grinding compound at the local auto parts store, slap it on there, um, use something to apply pressure to the bolt body, and cycle the bolt a bunch of times and it'll eventually wear it in. You can put die cam on there and do all kinds of things uh, to see what uh, or how much you're taking down, how much still has contact. Uh, my preferred method of doing this is just to take the rifle to a qualified gunsmith, have them put the action and put the bolt in their lathe to cut the lugs true to the center line of the action cut the lugs in the bolt true to the center line of the bolt and make sure everything is centered up, everything is um, plumb to that center line of the action. Now, one thing that guys got to keep in mind when you start to lap actions, uh, Remingtons can have some pretty sloppy headspace to begin with. I'm sure there are quite a few other bolt actions out there, but I have the most experience with Remington actions. Uh, so if you're right on the edge of that headspace and you start lapping uh, those lugs, you're removing metal and you're moving that breech face back. So you are adding headspace to the rifle. Uh, so if you lap too much and you get too aggressive on it, you can open up your headspace. You're probably not going to cause a dangerous condition, um, but you are going to open that up and you may have some issues with some uh, ammunition that is on the edge or some brass that you've uh, fired quite a few times. Uh, so overall, it's just not a good thing to do. Uh, wait until you are getting ready to replace that barrel. Uh, take the rifle in and have a gunsmith 
true the action up while he replaces the barrel and chambers it. That way you end up with the best possible condition, the best lug engagement, and the tightest chamber that you can get overall. And that will give you the best shooting rifle. I don't really think for PRS style competition or hunting, uh, that kind of thing, that uh, lapping the lugs is going to give you enough of an accuracy benefit uh, to make it worthwhile. And there is definitely the possibility to do it poorly and cause some damage to your rifle. So overall, I just say stay away from it. Our next question comes from Jeffrey and Jeffrey asks, shooting weak side is a weakness for me. I have trouble being able to get my eye aligned to look down my optic. What solutions do you have to possibly remedy this? It's a Manners T4 stock that is non-adjustable. Thanks for all the tips. It's helped improve my skills immensely. Please keep up the great work. Well, Jeffrey, uh, first of all, I will preface this question by saying uh, everyone is different. Uh, everyone has different facial structure. Uh, we, you know, humans have bilateral symmetry to a point. It means your left and right is very similar, uh, but we uh, all have little minor differences. I have one ear that is higher than the other. Um, you know, I noticed that greatly when I put on ear protection uh, that's really close fitting. Uh, but your left and your right side should be fairly close, but they aren't going to be absolutely perfect. So you may need to make minor adjustments uh, when you are shooting support side from what you would normally shoot on your strong side. But I would start out by making sure that your rifle is well fitted to you on your strong side. Make sure your comb is the right height, your length of pull is dialed in. And I say make sure you do this on your strong side because most of us, when we switch to support side shooting, it feels totally wrong. It doesn't feel right at all. And so if you try to adjust things based on that, uh, you're going to run into some problems. It's much better to get that rifle dialed in on your strong side and then adapt that support side position until it feels right. Uh, now, a lot of guys will, will start to cock their head and climb up over the, the comb and do all kinds of weird stuff. Um, you're just going to have to get behind the rifle and you're going to have to work with that head position until you get rid of your scope shadow and get your correct uh, eye relief behind the scope. And once you get that position, remember that position, stand up, break it, get down behind the rifle, get the position again. Uh, I would recommend that when you do your support side training, uh, keep the round count low. So get down, build your position, fire your shot, stand back up, readjust, relax, get back down, build the position again. And building that position over and over again will build that repetition. It will build those uh, pathways and it will make it easier and easier for you to drop down quickly on the rifle and get that support side position. For me, I generally don't have any problems shooting support side, uh, but for a while I had trouble getting into the support side position quickly. Uh, anytime I would jump on the rifle, even if the stage briefing was to start support side, as soon as I jump on the rifle, I'd want to pull it in to that strong side shoulder. Uh, so it took a little while for me to get that um, memory built up uh, to jump on the rifle and go immediately to support side. Uh, for CQB shooting, which I realize is quite a bit different than this, uh, it took me a while switching back and forth and back and forth until I could get to the point where I could very quickly glide from one position to another position, swap sides, and accurately engage a target uh, from my support side. Um, that stuff gets even more difficult because you're wearing a lot of gear, you're wearing body armor, all this stuff, uh, and there are some different tricks to do that. But the main focus is uh, building those neural pathways, building that um, muscle memory uh, to get the rifle set where you need it to be set. And it's just going to be getting down behind the rifle and working with it. Uh, now, if you have a physical uh, disability that causes you problems, maybe you have a severely broken clavicle on one side or or you have uh, some damage to the facial bones on one side that have been rebuilt, um, then you may have to start looking at adjusting your stock and then marking adjustments on them. I know you said you have a uh, non-adjustable T4. That's going to cause you some issues uh, because you can't... Uh, if you build your cheek pad up or you build your length of pull up for one side, it's going to mess you up on the other side. Uh, so... If you're going to stick with a non-adjustable stock, you're just going to have to kind of make do and just work on getting that position. Uh, but get behind the rifle, 
try to get into a position that feels natural and then adjust based on that. It won't feel natural at first, but it will feel better as you keep at it and as you go along. So I hope that gives you a little bit of help. Um, please give it some work. Uh, come back. Let me know how it works out for you. Our next question is from Greg, and Greg asks, I'm currently building a Precision 260 Remington rifle. I have a Criterion barrel on a Trude Remington action, and I'm currently waiting on funds for an XLR element chassis. I have a spare Boyd's hardwood stock that I can put on it. If I start load development in the Boyd stock, will I have to start over when I acquire the chassis? Thanks for all your insight in the shooting community. Uh, well, Greg... There are going to be a couple of factors in here that are going to affect if this will work or not. Uh, first of all, the uh, Boyd stock that you have, uh, if it is fully free floated and it's not touching the barrel anywhere, uh, then it is possible for you to do your load workup on that and then have that load workup work very well when you switch over to the chassis. Now, if you have any kind of pressure pads or there's any kind of contact in there, uh, then that can change the harmonics of the barrel and it can cause you some issues. Um, additionally, it's going to depend upon how accurate your setup will shoot. Uh, so if you are doing a uh, OCW low workup or something of that nature, you need the accuracy of the rifle uh, in order to accurately choose which uh, charge weight you want to go with. Uh, if you are doing a velocity-based low workup, then no, you can absolutely do a velocity-based workup uh, in another stock. Uh, so those are some options for you. I would go ahead and uh, throw it in that stock, go out, do your load workup. Uh, the worst possible case that you're going to run into is whatever load that you've settled on, uh, you get the new chassis in, you bolt everything up, and maybe it doesn't shoot exactly where you want it to. And at least then uh, you have an idea of what your pressure limits are and you have an idea of where to start working to tweak that load for the new setup. But I think if you're doing a velocity-based load workup, then you'll be just fine using a different stock and then switching later on. Uh, so give it a try. Uh, if anything, you're getting that rifle out and you're actually shooting, you're getting some work done with it. So give that a try. And our next question comes from Seth. And Seth asks, what is your preference for reticles on rimfire rifles? Do you think a Christmas tree style such as the H59 is necessary because of the large amount of drop? Also, is reticle width more of a factor in rimfire matches? Uh, well, Seth, if you are shooting NRL type stuff where your maximum range is 100 yards, I don't think the Christmas tree reticles are really necessary. Um, I like them because there is still a little bit of wind hold if you really get a big wind gust. Uh, and I like to be able to use that rifle for other things than just NRL 22 matches. Uh, for rimfire shooting, if you're using it as a training rifle to train for um, wind holds and wind estimation, uh, then absolutely, I think the Christmas tree style reticles like the H59 are a great option uh, because as you step out to those extended ranges, you are going to utilize the drop scale and you are going to utilize the wind holds on either side of that vertical stadia line. Uh, so just like you would use shooting a thousand yards with a long range rifle, uh, shooting 300 yards with a 22 is going to utilize the same kind of techniques uh, when using holds. So I think it's an absolutely uh, great option. And that reticle is really not going to get in the way if you come back and you start doing shorter range stuff like for the NRL matches. Uh, now you ask about reticle width. Um, I haven't found the reticle width, even in the first focal plane reticles, to be much of an issue. Uh, even shooting the uh, little quarter inch targets at uh, 25 yards with the NRL stuff. Uh, so that's really not a problem at all. Um, my preference is for a open center with a dot. And if I can have an open center with a dot, then really for um, super fine holds on a target, uh, it works really well. Now, there obviously is a point where things start to get too thick. Uh, some of your uh, lower magnification scopes can have uh, thicker reticles, and that may cause you some problems if you are trying to hit those little tiny uh, scoring marks or the little tiny uh, steel targets. Uh, but so far, with most of the scopes that I've tried, the, the Athlon, uh, the SWFA SS, and uh, a few others, uh, 
uh, the reticle thickness has not been an issue whatsoever. Uh, so if you are looking at something, uh, for instance, one of the Vortex reticles that has a Christmas tree in it in the uh, Viper PST line, uh, that would be a really good option for rimfire shooting. And again, I'm still uh, on the fence, but I may end up with a Viper PST Gen 2 5 to 25 uh, on my open class rifle for NRL 22. And if I do, it will have Vortex's uh, Christmas tree reticle in it. So that is it for the questions for this Monday. And I'm gonna talk about gloves real quick. Uh, and the reason I'm going to talk about them is it is still pretty cold here. We've got uh, snowfall for the last uh, few days, but I've still been going out to the range and through my regular daily job, I have to have gloves on that still afford me enough dexterity to manipulate weapons. Uh, so I want to tell you guys about some different gloves that I've been working with. Uh, I originally purchased a set of... Um, well, let me back up. Uh, during the summer and during the warm weather, uh, I've been using the Outdoor Research Halberd sensor gloves. Now, before I go any further, I'll tell you, Outdoor Research is not sponsoring this episode at all. Uh, all these were purchased with my own money. I'm just letting you guys know some things that have worked for me since we've got a lot of questions on gloves uh, this season. Now, the Outdoor Research Halberd gloves, I've used these. Uh, you've seen them pop up in some of the different review videos that we've shot. Uh, they have worked really well, but they are really thin. Uh, the back has uh, kind of a mesh material on them. And in cold weather, they still work okay. They work great as contact gloves just to keep my skin off metal. Uh, but when the wind blows, it will blow through the mesh on the back and it will cool the back of your hands off. Um, Additionally, the uh, palms and all the, the fingers have uh, perforations in them, so they are vented a little bit. So there's nothing to keep uh, a layer of warm air next to your skin. So when the temperatures uh, drop below freezing, they start to get a little cold wearing these gloves. So I was searching for a better option there, and because I already knew my size in outdoor research gloves, these are medium, they fit perfect, they fit like a glove. Um, but they fit perfect for my hands. So I felt confident getting online and purchasing another set of outdoor research gloves in the same size. And I went with the outdoor research cold shot gloves. Uh, now these gloves don't have any of the sensor technology that these guys have in them, uh, but they are kind of a, a neoprene type glove with a little bit of insulation in them and a little bit heavier duty leather on the front. So they're not really an insulated glove. Uh, but they should help keep the uh, the wind out a little bit more, and they should be uh, a, still fairly protective with uh, the leather coating or the leather palms and leather fingers here. So I ordered a set of medium in the cold shot gloves. Unfortunately, when they arrived, they were incredibly tight. Uh, and I realized that a lot of times, especially with leather gloves, when you get them, they're tight, you break them in over time. Uh, with patrol gloves for law enforcement, I used to wear just the regular standard uh, leather patrol gloves until I got several sets of those covered in blood and blood doesn't wash out of leather, big nasty thing. So um, those had a break-in period. Um, I tried to break these in. I wore them a couple of nights uh, on patrol. I wore them out walking the dogs. So that way I was curling my hands to hold the leashes, that kind of thing. And I would come back with the seams just imprinted on my hands. And then the pull loop on them started to tear loose from trying to pull them on uh, because they were so tight. Uh, so I contacted Outdoor Research Customer Service because they do have their infinity guarantee. They have fairly good warranty on their products. And I let them know what the problem was. The pull loop is a warranty issue. The sizing, uh, you could argue if it is or if it isn't a warranty issue. If it's the factory's fault that the sizing is different, that's one thing. If it just doesn't fit, uh, it's not really a sizing issue. But when I talked to them, they told me that the they were aware that the sizing on the cold shot gloves uh, was a bit different. The pattern was different from other gloves in their lineup. Uh, so they would go ahead and exchange these guys for me, which is great. It took a little while. I emailed their customer service. All this was over email, and I emailed them right before the uh, Christmas, New Year's holiday break. Uh, so it took a little while to get a reply. But once I got a reply, everything was good to go. And they went ahead and uh, replaced the gloves for me. Uh, so those actually just arrived about 
20 minutes ago, uh, right before I started working up the show today. Uh, so I had enough time to slide the large version on and they fit just fine. They fit like the mediums do in the other glove line. So if you are used to outdoor research gloves and you want to buy a set of cold shots, uh, size up one size uh, and that should help you out on those. While I was waiting for these to show up, I did end up purchasing another set of gloves uh, just to kind of tide me over. And I picked up the Outdoor Research PL400 gloves. Now these are fairly simple. Uh, they are just kind of a fleece-like material. They have some uh, rubber detail on the palms and on the tips of the fingers. And they are sensor gloves, so they do have sensor material in the uh, index finger and in the thumb which allow me to operate the iPhone just fine. And I know a lot of you guys have written into me and said, just, just get the metallic thread, do it yourself, all this stuff. I, I kind of prefer an integrated solution in the gloves. I know it's absolutely possible to do so. Uh, but if I have the option to pick gloves that are sensor capable, I'll pick the gloves that are sensor capable. Uh, additionally, what I've kind of found is it seems like in some of these gloves, they will make the tips or the pads of the index finger and the thumb a little bit thinner on sensor gloves, which helps for shooting and weapons manipulation because you have a little bit uh, thinner material there to be able to feel the controls on the weapon. So I uh, got these guys in there really not that expensive and these have become my favorite glove. I've taken them out to the range, done some shooting with them so far. Uh, shot uh, at least one match with them so far, and they are really one of my favorites. Now, I had them out shooting today, and uh, I've cleaned the cars off a couple of times with them. Had to clean the car off today, uh, get all the snow in that off, and they don't seem to suck up snow and water like some of my other fleece gloves have. Uh, they have, uh, they appear to have a uh, durable water-resistant coating on the outside of them because water will beat up and roll off uh, if it is uh, really a light misting or whatever. Now, uh, one issue I did have is I spilled my coffee on them today, and that was right after we got out to the range, slipped on some ice, you know, knocked my coffee cup over, spilled coffee all over my right-handed glove. I fully expected that this guy was going to get cold and get nasty, and I was really going to have a uh, a bad time out there uh, with the, the whole back of my glove and the index finger soaked in coffee. Uh, well, they dried out really, really fast, and they kept my hands warm the whole time. So I am really impressed with these gloves. Now I know it's not a full review. Uh, maybe we'll have some time to shoot a full review with some more detailed shots, uh, but I can fully endorse uh, the Outdoor Research PL400 gloves. Again, we're not sponsored. I'll leave a link for them down below. Uh, you click the Amazon link, then we'll get a little bit, uh, a few coins in the jar if you pick them up. Uh, but again, I purchased these with my own money, tried them out. I really like them. I actually think I like them better uh, than the North Face gloves that I talked about a couple of episodes uh, ago. Uh, they also pick up hair less, so um, my dogs, their hair is not constantly stuck to the gloves. Uh, the one drawback that I can say on these gloves so far is the little rubber pads on the fingertips uh, has uh, peeled off of the high-use fingers, and that's fully to be expected. Uh, the uh, halberd gloves here, all the little uh, rubber dots are pretty much peeling off of those. I've yet to have a set of gloves that any of the rubber appliques actually stay on them. They'll peel off. If it really bothers you, you can come back with some seam grip or something and, and stick it on there. It doesn't bother me at all. And I do have just a couple of snags on the glove uh, here and there. Uh, again, from weapons manipulation. Uh, today, I was running a 1911. I found that with these gloves, it makes it really hard for me to rotate quickly on the gun and get up there and hit the uh, slide release. Uh, so I was slingshotting over the top, and I think that developed a couple of snags just coming across and grabbing the weapon. Uh, so again, at the price, if, if I have to replace these in a year or two, not a big deal at all. Uh, they work really well. They're real comfortable, and the rubber grip does work really well on a steering wheel, uh, so I don't have to worry about my hands sliding on the steering wheel. Uh, so I can definitely uh, give these gloves my recommendation. I can operate my iPhone just fine with them, and they ball up and stick in a pocket real easy. 
so that's the gloves situation for right now. Once I get these out, I'll probably wear them tonight and uh, start stretching them out and uh, getting them broken in. And we'll see how well the Outdoor Research Cold Shot gloves work overall. Uh, that's it for this episode. If you guys have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments section down below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast app, you can send questions to us at 8541tactical at gmail.com. If you like the content, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. We would love to have you and uh, love to see you over there on that community. And until next time, get out and shoot.